God bless the great state of Florida. In about an hour, I've got to fly to Washington, D.C., so I relish the time spending in America. I'm going to commit a radical act. I'm going to speak the truth. America is great. The Taliban are terrorists. The Chinese communists are evil bastards. Christopher Columbus discovering America was a good thing. George Washington was an extraordinary national hero. Thomas Jefferson was an extraordinary national hero. Abraham Lincoln was an extraordinary national hero. Police officers keep us safe. Israel is our friend. The Wuhan virus came from Wuhan. And there is a difference between boys and girls. I want you to pause and think for a minute. Five years ago, every one of those statements would have been viewed as completely unobjectionable, in fact, blazingly obvious. Only an imbecile would have disputed that litany. Today, uttering any of those words can get you fired, can get you canceled, can get you erased from social media can get you expelled from your school. We're in the midst of a battle. So I'm grateful to the men and women who are gathered here. I'm grateful for the men and women who are gathered here thinking about how do we fight back and how do we take this country back. Now this is a room of thinkers. This is a room of intellectuals. This is also a room of business leaders and people that will deploy capital in a way that matters. So thinking about these issues and challenges is important. And there are a lot of people asking, what is nationalism? What is populism? What is conservatism? Well, let me tell you my thoughts on what it is and what it isn't, and then let's talk about how it should apply to the challenges facing this country. I think when you think about nationalism and populism and conservatism, it means, number one, defending unapologetically the United States of America. It means, number two, standing with working men and women. You want to understand the core of populism's one of the great lies in politics is the lie that Republicans are the party of the rich and Democrats are the party of the poor and working class. There may have been a time in which that is true, but that ain't today. Today, the Democratic Party is the party of rich coastal elites who look down on the working men and women. And I believe if the Republican Party has a future, and I believe we do, we need to be the party of working men and women. We need to be the party of truck drivers and steel workers and construction workers and cops and firefighters and waiters and waitresses and everybody who has calluses on their hands and is working. So what is nationalism and populism and conservatism not? Number one, it's not a recipe for right-wing big government. 
There's some who are thinking through what to do, who are suggesting the answer is more government power over every aspect of our life, but in a more conservative direction rather than a more liberal direction. And let me tell you right now, tyranny never works out for those being governed. It's pretty good for the tyrant, and the subjects suffer. Let me tell you secondly, it's not protectionism. It is not simply saying we are going to cease doing trade with the rest of the world. There are still enormous benefits from trade, but we have to recognize our enemies of the world, and in particular China. And third, it's not isolationism. There's some voices who would say, let's pull up the bridges, let's shut off the rest of the world and retreat in weakness. That, I believe, is a mistake. Now, should we engage in the military adventurism that we've seen both parties engage in? I don't think so. I think we should be much more reluctant to use military power, but I also believe in peace through strength. And a weak America is a dangerous America, is a vulnerable America, and it leaves the world vulnerable. What I want to do this morning is I want to talk about three principles for fighting back on what we see. And then I want to talk about seven battlefields. Let's start with three principles. Principle number one, the left's attack is on America. More fundamentally than anything else, the left hates America. The left hates who America is. The left hates what we stand for. We have to understand that the Marxists who are tearing down our institutions despise this country. They despise the principles on which it is built. They despise the freedom on which it is built. When you see mobs tearing down statues, remember they told us it was just about the Confederacy? Then they began tearing down George Washington. Last I checked, Washington wasn't a Confederate. Then they began tearing down Thomas Jefferson. Then, absurdly, they began tearing down Frederick Douglass because these lefties are so ignorant, they don't even know who Frederick Douglass is. They just hate anything that happened yesterday because they've been indoctrinated that America is evil. Don't misunderstand their target. It is to destroy this country. Secondly, it's been said that politics is downstream from culture. Well, I'll tell you today, it's all culture. Everything is culture. The culture has suffused every institution of our society. We have to understand culture and fight back. And by the way, the press is very fond of saying, oh, the right is engaged in culture war. Bullshit. It is the left that is using culture as a tool to try to destroy America. And defending this nation is not a culture war. It is defending the country and the freedom and the blessings that we have as Americans. And the third principle is very simple. Fight. Dear God, fight. Look, Donald Trump is a unique individual. <laughs> in many respects. But the press and the pointy-headed intellectuals, they say, I can't understand why so many Americans love this man. Well, let me explain very simply. Because after all of the weakness and surrender and imbecility, thank God the man stands up and fights. You can be forgiven for an awful lot 
if you just finally discover the testicular fortitude to stand and fight for something. There are so many people in politics that are scared of their own shadow. There are so many people in politics who say, Oh dear God, they might tweet something terrible about me. Let's pretend we believe a tiny fraction of what it is we're saying. Let's pretend we really believe we are fighting to defend this nation then we can't be timid and we've got to fight. Now, where do we want to fight? I want to identify seven battlefields. This is not a comprehensive list, but it's an awfully good place to start. The first battlefield is big tech. Big tech, I believe, is the single greatest threat to free speech and free elections in the United States. Big tech is malevolent, big tech is corrupt, big tech is omnipresent. And listen, there has always been bias. There has been bias in media from the first moment cavemen, the first so-called journalist carved some words into a stone, there were biased reporters. But William Randolph Hearst could not have imagined at the height of yellow journalism the absolute invidious and invisible power of big tech. The ability, if there's a view they don't like, to simply disappear it. Look, when you read garbage papers, you can tell they're biased three words into it. Big tech is dangerous because it is by design invisible. If they don't like what you have to say, suddenly it disappears. I have a feeling this conference is magically going into the ether because it is contrary to what the oligarchs in Silicon Valley want. They have the ability to shadow ban. They have the ability also to collate your feed subtly so that you only see what they want you to see. It is profoundly pernicious. And let me say, even if someone is left of center, but is not a Marxist, you should be troubled by the state of affairs of big tech. Who in their right mind would want all political discourse in America governed by a handful of billionaires in Silicon Valley? For those who say right now, gosh, I like their political preferences. You know what? There came a pharaoh who knew not Joseph and his sons. If you cede monopoly power to giant, omnipotent man-children, it doesn't end well. And so we need to use every single tool we have. We need to flood the zone. That means using the antitrust laws. That means using the consumer protection laws. That means using the powers of the states and state legislatures and state attorneys general. That means using every tool we have to end the corrupt monopolists. The second battleground is left-wing authoritarianism. And by this I mean in particular the pandemic tyranny we've seen of the last two years. You know, in any crisis it reveals character. And we have seen the character of the hard left. With shutdowns, the willingness to destroy millions of small businesses. Shut down Restaurants and bars and stores, destroying livelihoods, sometimes businesses that had been built over generations, for handed down from grandparent to parent to child. And these petty tyrants were more than happy with a stroke of a pen to obliterate years, decades of work. And by the way, I talked about standing for the working men and women. You noticed 
these, these left-wing authoritarians were happy to let the giant corporations open up. So Walmart was perfectly safe. But the mom and pop store needed to go out of business right now because you know what? Small businesses are very dangerous for the virus. What utter garbage. Destroying businesses, shutting down schools. By the way, these tyrants don't care about kids. Tens of millions of kids stayed home from school for a year. We know that those children are falling behind and in all likelihood will never catch up again. They weren't learning reading or writing or arithmetic or history or science or art or much of anything. Look, I got to tell you, Heidi and I, our girls are 11 and 13. We were doing distance learning with the two of them. Heidi had the 13-year-old. I had the 11-year-old. We were in two different rooms. It wasn't easy with two parents and the ability to focus a lot of time on helping the kids. I can't imagine what it was like for a single mom. Single mom with three, four kids trying to work a job somewhere. The answer for an awful lot of kids is they just didn't go to school. And it started off, it was two weeks to slow the spread. And then it became a month, and then it became month after month after month after month. And the petty authoritarianism. One of the moments that I think encapsulated it perfectly was in California. When one local official sent bulldozers to fill a skate park with sand. Because those pesky teenagers might actually want to go skateboarding. What joyless jerks. And now we're seeing in the name of the pandemic, mask mandates, vaccine mandates, vaccine passports. And by the way, the utter hypocrisy of it. So we spent a year with Democrats and the press and everyone talking about the heroes, the frontline heroes, the cops, the firefighters, the doctors, the nurses. And they were right. They were heroes. What does the left want to do now? Fire any one of them that dares defy them. Biggest hospital in New York just fired 1,400 employees, doctors and nurses. So we got a pandemic. Explain to me the logic behind firing thousands of doctors and nurses. It's idiocy, our active duty military. Soldiers, sa sailors, airmen and Marines. Joe Biden is saying if you don't take the vaccine, you're fired. I've talked with Navy SEALs who've gone through incredible training, training I could never survive for a minute, who spent a decade or more defending this nation and are now resigning because their commander-in-chief doesn't give a damn about keeping this country safe, but is willing to be a petty tyrant. Airline pilots and air traffic controllers, by the way, among others, they took out Senator Rubio. He was supposed to be here this morning. They canceled his flight. Joe Biden was asked in a recent town hall, so cops, who refused to get the vaccine, should they be fired? Here's Joe Biden's detailed, nuanced, intellectual answer. Yes. One word. That's it. By the way, last week we had a hearing in the Senate Judiciary Committee with Merrick Garland. I had a few gentle questions for him. One of my questions was on this. General Garland, Joe Biden says that cops who refuse to be vaccinated should be fired. You're the chief law enforcement officer for the United States. Do you agree with Joe Biden? Garland refuses to answer. Oh, uh, well, well, I, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. But, sir, city of Chicago, more than a third of the police officers in the city of Chicago have refused to provide their vaccination status. Do you believe Chicago should fire a third of its police officers while its crime is skyrocketing and its homicide rate is skyrocketing? 
Garland, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, no. Sir, he said, that's a question for Chicago. Baloney, you're the Attorney General of the United States. You're telling me you don't have an opinion on whether it's a good idea to fire a third of the Chicago Police Department. By the way, let me say to police officers in Chicago and New York and any other place governed by petty tyrants, come to Texas. We want you in Texas. Third battlefield, critical race theory. You just heard from Chris Rufo. Chris is an impressive, serious, creative fighter. Critical race theory is pernicious. It is based on a pile of lies. It derives directly from Marxism. Marxism framed all of society as an inevitable battle between classes, between the owners of capital and the workers. Marxism posits that that conflict is inevitable, and the inevitable result is a revolution of the proletariat that overthrows the owners of capital. Critical race theory is entirely derivative. It uses the exact same world frame, except instead of dividing us based on socioeconomic status, it divides us based on race. Critical race theory teaches that America is fundamentally racist, that all white people are racist, that all people of color are oppressed. They are the new proletariat, that that conflict is inevitable and that the only solution is a revolution of the oppressed overthrowing the oppressors. It is based on a pack of lies. Now listen, when you discuss and debate critical race theory, some people try to engage on the other side in a reductionist straw man. They say, well, you're saying racism doesn't exist. You're saying slavery doesn't exist. No, we're not imbeciles. Of course slavery existed. It was the original sin of our nation. And we fought a bloody civil war where 600,000 Americans lost their lives to expunge that sin. Of course racism exists. The Ku Klux Klan, which by the way was founded by the Democratic Party, was an instrument and tool of racism. And by the way, let me say of these total hypocrites, there's some people who say when you bring up the fact that the KKK was founded by Democrats, 100% Democrats, every one of them. Nathan Bedford Forrest, the founder of the Klan, was a delegate to the 1860 Democratic National Convention. Every founder of the Democratic Party, or rather every Klansman was part of the Democratic Party of the leaders. Jim Crow. Jim Crow laws were written exclusively by Democrats. Democrat politicians writing laws to keep Democrat politicians in power. The Republican Party, the party of which I'm proudly a member, was founded because slavery is evil. It was founded to overthrow slavery. Abraham Lincoln was the first Republican president, and I'm damn proud of that. And for those leftists who say, well, yes, yes, that was true for 100 years. But then magically in the 1960s, it all switched. It was all that pesky Richard Nixon, and suddenly the two parties inverted. OK, let's talk present day. Right now, today, who's the governor of Virginia? Got him, Ralph Northam. Ralph Northam, on his medical school yearbook, what did he have? We all know about the guy in blackface. Who was he standing next to? Someone dressed as a Klansman. The day the story broke, what did Northam say? Well, yes, I could have been one of those two people. I don't know. Now, the media, in their sort of bizarre perversion, turned this into the, quote, blackface scandal. Now, look, I get why wearing blackface could be offensive. I don't get the sort of overwrought hysteria about it. I've, I've never dressed at it. It seems apparently every Democrat in Virginia has. 
But what struck me as bizarre is there were two people there. I don't view that as the blackface scandal. I view that as the Klans, Klansman scandal. And if you cannot say, I have never dressed as a Klansman, which apparently the sitting governor of Virginia cannot say, then you shouldn't be in public office. And by the way, Ralph Northam is not an outlier. Joe Biden was down campaigning in Virginia last week. He looked out at Ralph Northam and said, hey, pal. And we shouldn't be surprised that he calls him pal. 11 years ago, Joseph Biden gave the eulogy at the funeral of Robert Byrd. Now, who was Robert Byrd? Robert Byrd was the Senate Majority Leader for the Democrats from West Virginia. He was an exalted cyclops of the Ku Klux Klan. When was that funeral? It wasn't 1950, it wasn't 1960, it wasn't even 1970. 1970 is when I was born. 72 is when Biden showed up in the Senate. So I was a year and a half when Biden arrived. It was 2010. 2010. You know what, Joe Biden? If you give a eulogy for an exalted cyclops of the Ku Klux Klan, you've lost any moral standing to lecture the rest of us on your racial wokeness. It is utter and complete hypocrisy and we need to fight for, number, the fourth battlefield is the media. And let me say something, the phrase mainstream media, I want to encourage everyone here to ban it from your lexicon. Because it's a lie. There is nothing mainstream about these guys. The phrase I like is corrupt corporate media. Because it is who they are. And I want to tell you about something really profound that has happened to journalism. It's broken. Let's go back five years ago when I started the litany at the beginning of these remarks. I talked about each of those statements would have been unobjectionable five years ago. Five years ago, the media was bad. They leaned left hard. Let's take an institution like CNN. I used to go out on CNN all the time. Sometimes once a week or more, and you could see CNN would try. They were always leaning left, but they, they cared about being balanced. Or they at least said they cared about being balanced. So they would try to have a panel of one sort of conservative and four leftists to, to argue that they're evil but they'd make a tiny gesture in that direction. Have you noticed nobody today argues the media are not biased? Donald Trump broke the media. They loathe him so much, they foam at the mouth, it, they don't hide it. And they now view their roles, it's not to report on facts. It's not to be balanced. It is to be propagandist for the left wing of the Democratic Party. That's how they view their message. And I say corporate media because you need to understand it's not the talent. It's the corner office that makes a decision. Jeff Zucker decided CNN is the propagandist for the left and everyone else just obeys orders and we need to burn them to the ground. The fifth battlefield are woke corporations. And we've seen, particularly in the last couple of years, big business, the Fortune 500, becoming the economic enforcers of the hard left. Take a look at the boards of directors of every big company. Name, all right, I'll make it easier. Name five Fortune 500 CEOs who are even remotely right of center, who have the tiniest shred of courage to stand on anything. The entire phalanx of big business has gone hard left. By the way, that's one of the reasons I announced months ago 
that I won't accept a penny from any corporate PAC in America. And I got to tell you, by the way, it actually freaks Washington out. Think about the corrupt world. Normally, if you say, I'm not going to support you, that freaks them out. If you say, I won't take your stinking money, that scares the heck out of them. And I think we need a lot more Republicans with the courage to say, corporate PACs can go jump in a lake if you are going to use your resources to try to destroy the republic and try to destroy the nation. I don't want a penny from you. Sixth, Hollywood. Hollywood is a force of propaganda, a force of lies, a force of culture, a force of deception, and it is systematically working to brainwash young people, Americans. Think about it. When was the last time you saw a business owner portrayed positively in a movie? In any context. Look, I'm glad, Chris, what a CEO is just poisoning kids. Or maybe embezzling when they're not actually like committing mass murder. Hollywood, they don't view their role as storytellers. They are propagandists. They have a mission. And their mission is to spread this assault on America. And, this, and, and by the way, one of the reasons they've embraced this mission is what's the biggest movie market in the world? China. And Hollywood very happily is willing to submit to Chinese censorship. You know, the new Top Gun movie's coming out. Top Gun, the original Top Gun, maybe the best Navy recruiting film ever produced. Has there ever been a badass like Tom Cruise in Top Gun? Not Ted, Tom. I, I was once paged on an airplane as Tom Cruise. You have never seen so many disappointed flight attendants. <laughs> They're just like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so the new Top Gun, Top Gun 2, Maverick's jacket, the original jacket on the back, has the flag of Japan and the fat flag of Taiwan. Well, the communist overlords in China don't like, they hate Japan, and they refuse to acknowledge Taiwan exists. So, so what did the American movie studio do? Erased it from the jacket. We now have Maverick scared of the Chinese communists. God help us. Listen, China is the single greatest geopolitical threat facing the United States for the next century. They're a military threat. They're an economic threat. They engage in espionage. They engage in propaganda. They engage in murder. They engage in torture. They have concentration camps. And, and let me be clear. My family was imprisoned and tortured in Cuba. When it comes to communists, I hate communists. Nine years ago when I arrived in the Senate, I was making the argument that China was the greatest threat to America. And at the time, that was a very lonely view. All of the Democrats and most of the Republicans disagreed. They said, ooh, there's money to be made. COVID has changed a lot of people's perceptions. I think we need to approach China as we did the Cold War. The way we won the Cold War through shining a light, through calling them out, through economic tools, military tools, diplomatic tools. Nobody wants a shooting war with China. But we won the Cold War without firing a shot. And it takes the seriousness of mind to use the tools to take on their espionage, take on their lies, to defund their espionage regime and to pull our supply chain out of China so we're not economically vulnerable to their captivity. I'm going to make a couple of closing comments. Number one, there's a tendency by some on the right to be pessimistic, to be dour. 
to say, oh, it's all hopeless. We're all going to die. I got to tell you, I'm not one of those. I am deeply and profoundly optimistic. I'm optimistic, number one, because there's a natural pendulum effect to politics. It's been true throughout the history of America. One party gets in power, they go too far one direction, and the American people say, hold on a second, they pull it the other way. Other party gets in, they go too far the other direction, the American people say, hold on a second, they pull it back the other way. That has played out for hundreds of years. Every time I see a dumbass decision from this administration, of which there are a lot, part of me grieves. Part of me grieves for the country and the consequences of the country, but part of me quietly celebrates because they are accelerating people opening their eyes and realizing this is crazy. And it took Jimmy Carter to give us Ronald Reagan. Carter had never been elected. Remember, Reagan was this crazy right-wing cowboy, completely unelectable. The answer was pick Republicans who stand for nothing, who are part of the uniparty, because no one would actually vote for someone principled who believed in America. And Jimmy Carter's disaster, inflation, unemployment, military disaster abroad, was so bad that it opened the door for the Reagan revolution. You look at what's happening in Washington right now, Somewhere in Georgia, right now, Jimmy Carter is saying, yes, not worst president ever. <laughs> and Joe Biden is setting the stage for a conservative revolution. So this gathering is important. And yes, these threats are real. And yes, the left hates you. And yes, they have seized the commanding heights of the transmission of ideas. But I believe truth prevails. Perhaps not immediately. Perhaps not in every battle. But over the long term. You know, several years ago, I was visiting with Natan Sharansky the famed Soviet dissident, visiting with him in Jerusalem. And Natan told me about being in the Soviet gulag and how the prisoners in the gulag would pass notes from cell to cell. Did you hear what Reagan said? Evil empire. When he called out the Soviet Union rightly as an evil empire. Ash heap of history. When Reagan said Marxism, Leninism will end up on the ash heap of history. When they asked Reagan, what's his strategy in the Cold War? He said, very simple, we win, they lose. And most importantly, when he stood in front of the Brandenburg Gate and he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. You know, that speech, if you go to my office, I have a gigantic painting, almost as big as this banner, of that speech of Reagan in front of the Brandenburg Gate. The backstory of that speech, three times the State Department edited those lines out of the speech. And three times Reagan wrote them back with his own hand, and the State Department said, Mr. President, you can't say this. It's too belligerent, it's too antagonistic, it's fighting too much. And they said, and most importantly, it's too unrealistic. The Berlin Wall will never, ever, ever come down no matter what we do. And Reagan, with a twinkle in his eye, he said, you don't understand. This is the whole point of the speech. And when Reagan delivered those words, all of the intelligentsia in Washington thought he was a fool. In less than three years, the Berlin Wall was torn to the ground, and it wasn't knocked down by American army tanks. It wasn't bombed by American missiles. It was the power of truth and light that tore it to the ground. We have done it before. We can do it again, and America is worth saving, and I'm proud to be fighting alongside you to save her. Thank you. God bless you.